Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Curtis Lockhart. I'm a researcher here at the Charter Cities Institute. Uh, CCI is an organization that's building the ecosystem for charter cities uh, with the ultimate mission of lifting tens of millions of people out of poverty. Um, CCI was set to host the Charter Cities Conference back on March 17th and 18th in Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, unfortunately, we had to make the extremely difficult decision to cancel the conference due to the pandemic and related public health concerns. Um, but because part of the conference was going to be researchers and academics presenting their research papers relevant to charter cities, we thought, why not allow these researchers the opportunity to present their papers online instead of in Joburg? Uh, and so we're doing just that. Uh, this is the first of several recordings where researchers finally get to present their work uh, to the world like they were supposed to do last month in, in Joburg. Uh, so without further ado, I'm joined here today by two such individuals, uh, Paul Healy and Matt Pruitt, both part of the Radical Exchange Movement. Uh, Paul, just briefly, is a law student at Yale a Law School and formerly studied development economics at Oxford. And Matt is the president of the Radical Exchange Foundation. So hi, Paul. Hi, Matt. Thank you both for joining me today. Thank you. Great. Uh, so the way we're going to structure this is Paul and Matt, they have a 15, 10 to 15 minute um, slide deck they're going to go through that presents the main takeaways from their paper called Building Radical Charter Cities. Uh, so I'll let them start to get that presentation teed up. And then after the slides, we'll have uh, a brief Q&A with me asking Paul and Matt some questions, and that'll be that. But before they start, um, perhaps, Matt, it'd be good for you to give everybody a brief primer on what Radical Exchange is all about, what you guys do, uh, just so folks have some context before diving into the presentation. Sure. Uh, so just to provide a little background and context, um, Radical Exchange movement is kind of a uh, decentralized um, uh, global movement uh, com consisting of, of, of several dozen chapters of discussion groups and local activist groups around the world that kind of grew out of the excitement around the book Radical Markets by uh, Glenn Weil and Eric Posner. Um, and uh, Radical Exchange Foundation, the organization that I help run, is uh, uh, dedicated to helping to build that movement and to uh, advance and, and, and uh, um, help push forward the, the ideas that are, that are coming out of it. Um, and um, what we are about in, in a nutshell is looking at the basic institutional layers in, the, you know, in essentially capitalism and democracy and thinking about how to update the update these kind of source code level institutions to make them more fair more just more efficient um, with a particular focus on um, the institutions uh, that um, uh, the sort of the, the rails on which our voting runs and the rails on which our, our property systems run mm -hmm. um, so our, our sort of our basic uh, hypothesis is that through uh, through a bit of uh, a bit of tweaking and a bit of perspectival shifting in in the basics of how the institutions of, of property and, and democracy are designed, we can uh, we can kind of um, first of all help to help to like bridge a lot of the uh, a lot of the divides between uh, traditional left and traditional right, and um, and second just. Um, it, Essentially, uh, help to help to facilitate a uh, uh, an economy and a political system that is less prone to the problems of uh, power concentration that you see uh, both in in our economy and in uh, and in our uh, uh, and in political systems when they when they sort of go wrong. Um, so that that's uh, that's what what radical exchange is about. That's that's our um, our mo and. Um, uh, uh, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll hand it to Paul to talk about some of the ideas we're working on and um, and how they relate to uh, to charter cities. Great, thanks a lot, Matt, and thanks thanks for the introduction, Curtis. 
Um, so I'll just go next to the motivation for this paper, um, building off of you know, Matt's introduction to radical exchange broadly. Um, as you can tell already, our, our focus is adjacent, I would say, to what Charter Cities movement is working on in that we you know, think about these deep institutional reforms. Um, and, and so that's kind of where the motivation for this paper came from. Um, you know, just very sort of like three simple propositions on the slide here that um, that are the basis for this paper. You know, the Charter Cities movement um, and Charter Cities Institute in particular aim to, um, as you said, Curtis, you know, lift tens of millions of people out of poverty by relieving governance related constraints and using innovative governance mechanisms um, to just spur economic growth. Um, but from our perspective, even the institutions in place, even in today's high income regions, are facing deep political and market failures, um, as Matt referred to, in terms of voting systems, property allocation systems. And so we see uh, an opportunity here to embed um, and experiment with radical exchange mechanisms to complement that traditional slate of governance reforms that, uh, that the Charter Cities Institute uh, traditionally has advocated for in, in Charter Cities. So that, that kind of sets up the, the motivation for this paper. And I'll just go back a couple slides to the, the abstract. Um, so I won't read every word off the slide here, but um, basically, we th this is the abstract for our, our forthcoming uh, policy paper. Uh, so we kind of set up this, um, you know, adjacency we see, and then int introduce that in this paper. We're going to be discussing uh, three radical exchange mechanisms. Uh, they're in bold at the bottom here. So SELSA, uh, self-assessed licenses sold via auction which is a better way to structure property rights and allocate um, productive resources in an economy. Second, quadratic finance, which is a better way to fund public goods. And third, quadratic voting, which is a better way to vote. So as you can see, you know, we're going after property allocation, funding public goods, and voting. So three really fundamental institutions in any economy, um, but particularly in the way cities work. So we'll start with SALSA. Um, this one sort of has the most to unpack. I'll try to keep it to a few minutes per mechanism to, so you know we have ample time for questions. And of course, this will require uh, skipping over a fair amount of the technical details, which both can find uh, in the paper when it comes out. So without further ado, self-assessed license is sold via auction, SELSA. Um, this is a mechanism for allocating scarce productive resources. Um, good examples to keep in mind are in a city, obviously land is a scarce productive resource. Um, you know, someone has to use the land for a certain purpose at a certain time, um, but also cities frequently allocate uh, licenses for certain activities. So a farmer's market, um, parking in certain spaces, uh, use of shared bikes or scooters. Um, and as we go forward discussing salsa, I would sort of keep in mind like land and other public licenses as the two uh, categories of applications, basically. Um, so, so SALSA improves upon uh, current, current approaches to sort of traditional private property rights and traditional publicly sold licenses um, because these are, these are subject to some deep market failures. Um, in land, holdout problems uh, are, are very common, particularly in land assembly. So we have uh, the picture on the bottom left here, kind of, a, uh, kind of a humorous depiction of a holdout problem where commercial development literally had to be constructed around this one woman's tiny house that she wouldn't sell even for like very, very high offers of like a million dollars. Um, she, you know, she, she had a property right to her home and she didn't want to give it up. Um, Literally even the, more, the house from up, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, you can see the balloon, the balloons there. Yeah. Um, and so even, even more troubling though is, is actually um, in land assembly, uh, in sort of a classic land assembly problem, the thing, the project at issue wouldn't even get built. Like you wouldn't even see this commercial development because if you need to assemble um, you know, multiple parts of land to construct a project across those. Um, and each individual landowner, once they realize that this is what's happening, can try to extract um, a price from you that's far above their own valuation of the property. And when all the individual landowners do that, um, the, the, they, they're sort of behaving like little monopolists and the project itself cannot get built uh, because the land can't be assembled. So that is, that's a sort of deep problem land. Um, in, in publicly allocated licenses, black markets uh, post problems. So on the bottom right here, this is a picture of a, a food cart in New York City. And the city uh, historically has distributed a certain uh, fixed quantity of food cart permits at a pretty low price, like a couple hundred dollars. But because they're artificially limiting the quantity of them, 
this creates a black market where the licenses sell for thousands of dollars. And this, uh, so first of, you know, first of all, black markets can frequently um, create sort of uh, illicit activity around them, but, but also it deprives the city government um, of revenue that it, it could have got if it priced the asset um, appropriately. So those are sort of, car those are sort of car current uh, market failures. Um, one brief note is that we want to be clear that salsa with salsa, we are not encouraging cities to artificially restrict quantities. Um, salsa doesn't tell you uh, what quantity of, of a certain resource should exist. And so that's why it's better. It's better for resources like land where there's a natural restriction. Um, you don't want to create a license just to use the salsa mechanism. So for instance, like taxi medallions generally under supply transportation services. Um, and so it might be better to just think about a, a more productive market scheme in general, rather than starting from that point and um, allowing, allowing salsa to operate. Um, that, that's kind of a brief note we discuss a bit more in the paper. So moving on, um, most importantly, so, so how does salsa work? Uh, it's a, it's a several-step process uh, we've depicted here. So first, an initial auction um, where, whether it's a license or a plot of land, you initially, you know, auction those, um, auction off those assets to the highest bidder, and then the second, um, the second sort of cycle here is 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 where the magic really happens. People put their own valuation, self-assessed valuation, into an online exchange system um, that they, that they sort of maintain, and they pay a salsa fee, which could be, for instance, uh, you know, ten percent, twenty percent, thirty percent. They pay that fee like a property tax to the to the government um, you know with some regularity uh, could be every month every year um, and while they're doing that anyone can enter that exchange and buy the asset from them at their declared price so it, it's it's effectively you declare your value which you pay a, a, a sort of property tax rate on and uh, anyone can come along and buy it if, if they value it even slightly more than you do. Um, and so you can see how the sort of forced exchange uh, eliminates the holdout problems because you have, when you're incentivized to honestly declare your value, someone can just come along and assemble, uh, you know, the necessary plots of land for a project without individually negotiating and being uh, liable to those sort of monopoly problems. So and, this is- And that right there, Paul, is the, is the main difference between salsa and individual ownership of private property, is that forced transaction, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's like, that's really the core of the mechanism. And um, we, we sort of refer to this as like the genius of salsa, the, the self incentivizing people to declare honestly their, their self-assessed valuation um, creates the, the efficiencies here. Um, and it's, it's both allocative efficiency and investment efficiency. So the allocative efficiency is on incentivizing um, and create, you know, creating a system where exchanges will happen when one party values an asset more than the other. Um, and we just discussed pretty simply, uh, with, with just simple arithmetic here, how this works. So if, if there's a 30% rate, um, a 30% tax rate and a 30% turnover rate, which would be like in any given time period, there's a 30% probability that someone comes along who happens to value the asset more highly and wants to buy it from you. Um, for instance, if those two things are 30%, if you overvalue, you are benefiting by it, an amount that's 0.3 times um, delta P, which would be the amount you overvalue by, you benefit because you get to sell it at a higher price to that person who comes along. Uh, but in the in the interim, you're penalized because you have to pay your salsa rate on this higher valuation that you have artificially set. Um, and so, in this in this little example, those two things cancel out, so you're incentivized to honestly assess and. Um, and it's, it, it, and it's symmetrical as well. So if you if you undervalue, you know you save some money on your tax uh, on your salsa revenues that you have to pay. But also, if someone could come along and they'll just have to pay you a lower price, so you you won't get as, as much revenue from that sale that happens with a thirty percent probability. Um, and so th this uh, this shows how the mechanism creates incentives to self assess, um, which promotes allocative efficiency, and uh, and it also reveals that. Uh, if the if the government is sort of purely focused on allocative efficiency, they would in fact want to set the salsa rate equal to, to the turnover rate, which they could they could try to elicit somehow through sort of trial and error. Um, and then on the investment efficiency side of things, because one, yeah, Matt, you want to jump in? Uh, I think we might want to explain the the turnover rate. So the um, 
the the turnover rate here is is a shorthand for the uh, the percent chance that a that an asset will find a new buyer in a given period of time, right? And it's it's by pegging by pegging the salsa rate uh, to the turnover rate that you uh, that you balance the incentive to overvalue your uh your license with the incentive to undervalue your license mm -hmm. so so theoretically if you if you you know if you make your best possible estimate about the chances that an asset will find a new buyer in a, in a given period of time set and set the set the you know the the tax rate at that percentage of the of of the self-assessed value then the the possessor of the license uh the optimal strategy from their point of view is to simply declare their true subjective reservation price, the amount of money for, that they would genuinely be willing to accept um, in exchange for handing over the, the license to, to another possessor. Yeah, th thanks, Matt, that's helpful. Um, and so uh, continuing on from there, you know, one of the most common um, sort of initial objections or concerns that we hear from folks uh, when we're discussing implementing Salsa is, well, hey, wait a second, if I'm subject to this sort of coerced sale at any moment when someone comes along, um, you know, will I be less likely to make investments in my, in my land or take actions that would be productive for the asset that I hold because I could just lose it at any moment. Um, and so, for, so, so this brings us to investment efficiency. Um, so first, this concern itself is not as serious as it may seem because owners will still have an incentive to make um, very productive investments insofar as those investments actually increase the value of the asset. So if you, if you make some productive investment in your land, you yourself will raise the value on the land. And then if someone comes along and uh, buys it from you, you're just going to get more money from them. And so, so you will actually realize the return on the investments you make. Um, there are some situations though, as we detail on the slide here, there are some situations where, um, investments that are not like not extremely productive ones, but still productive uh, from, from the, insofar as they increase the value of the asset by more than the investment required, um, where those would not get made because you are paying increased, uh, increased salsa payments as well. And so we have an example here of investing 75,000 to add a hundred thousand dollars of value um, from a hundred thousand to go from a hundred thousand to 200,000, um, value on an asset, you would not make that if the salsa rate were set exactly equal to the turnover rate. And so policymakers can slightly reduce the salsa rate um, below, it, below the turnover rate to encourage these productive investments to get made um, at the cost of a small amount of allocative efficiency. And uh, like a key insight that we go into more detail on in the paper is that uh, these slight reductions themselves are are optimal to make because they encourage uh, they would still encourage the most productive uh, transactions to happen from an allocated perspective um, while while enabling the most productive um, investments to occur so the gain so the gain that you get in investment efficiency is larger than the small loss initially in allocated efficiency as you slightly decrease um, so th so this is this is sort of the uh, the this is this is kind of the genius of salsa um, in, in terms of its its efficiency. So moving on to two quick examples. Um, first, commercial land. We think in charter cities. Um, you know, insofar as charter cities are uh, really really focused on encouraging productive commercial investment in a, in a in a certain urban area, using salsa for the commercial land in the city would be a great um, would be a great way to allocate it. So you would you know. The Charter City Authority or organization has the land, um, establishes through a city ordinance uh, the, the salsa rate, which we, you know, we just discussed how you sort of find the right uh, rate to set, and then leases plots of land to incoming commercial developers. And in the, basically, there's just a term in the lease that uh, subjects them to a forced, uh, to, to declare their valuations and then subjects them to a forced transfer of that lease uh, if someone at the online exchange declares a higher value and essentially purchases it from them. So you'd sort of simply carry out this, uh, carry out this auction exchange process. And, it, and um, uh, the second, 
just a quick thing, you know, and it's also when you think about this, it's really important to realize that the, you know, that whenever you're comparing this kind of interest in an asset to, you know, the more familiar kinds of interest in an asset, like a, like a, like a, you know, absolute ownership or, or a lease, um, you know, a, a salsa license to an asset would be cheaper than these other kinds of, of, uh, of interests, right? Because it, it's less of a, less of a permanent, less of an absolute interest. So, and that's reflected in the price. So it's not like, um, it's not really a, a dispossession because you know what you what you pay for when you buy this kind of 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 license is um, uh, uh, is, is is different, right? It's it's a it's a it's a different, more open kind of license that that allows the uh, allows assets to to flow to their more efficient owner in uh, in in a way that is you know fundamentally fundamentally quite different from the sorts of, of property tenure that, uh, that we, that we normally think of. So it's, impo it's important to, you know, just kind of, uh, shift into a different, uh, yeah. mode of thinking about that. And I was going to say, I guess the, the lower price just reflects the fact that there's this forced transaction, um, built into salsa. Yeah. I mean, like what one way of, I mean, one way, you know, if you've, um, you know, for those of us who, uh, once upon a time, we're first year law students, uh, you know, like the way that property rights are often described is they're like a bundle of sticks, you know, and you've got this, uh, you've got this bundle of, of rights or entitlements that are attached to the asset um, in your, in your possession. And, you know, in, in terms of the kind in, in, in traditional uh, fee simple land ownership, for example, you know, one of those, one of the, uh, one of the rights in that bundle of rights is the right to uh, um, the right to permanently refuse to sell at any price, mm. right? Um, and this is in in if you own a salsa license instead of a, a you know a fee simple, you know that what that stick is taken out of the bundle of sticks, so to speak. Yeah. So it's worth it's it's worth less, right? Which is which is a feature, not a bug, right? Because it's. It's it, it, that also means that there's the, the set of people who can, you know, get into the market is larger because the, you know, the, the asset itself is, is, is less expensive. Great. Thanks. Um, okay. So moving on to our, our second um, and may, maybe less, uh, less intuitive or less obvious application of salsa. Um, so transportation congestion is, of course, one of the largest negative externalities that exist, um, you know, in city life and uh, in particular in uh, low income countries. Um, most of the world's um, most congested cities are in are in lower income regions and this poses uh, poses large problems for, for urban life. So uh, in the paper, we propose uh, salsa as a, as a solution to this. So so a city uh, a charter city could release a certain number of vehicle use licenses. Um, in an online auction, you know, in the same way that they would for land, um, users would purchase these, which would, you know, or essentially a license to conduct the activity of uh, driving a car around around the city. Uh, similar similar schemes uh, like using lotteries or auctions for vehicle use already exist in um, in, in in some places like Beijing and Singapore, uh, but not quite and not quite in the salsa uh, way. So you know, the initial auction happens, and then the city. Uh, monitors congestion and basically adjusts the, uh, we're calling a dynamic cap, uh, adjusts the total number of licenses based on congestion. So the city may not, you know, may or may not get it right the first time or just conditions, city conditions may change. So if the city is, uh, if you monitor traffic levels and the city is uh, uh, below some, uh, below some uh, acceptable level of congestion, you could uh, release some more vehicle permits and then traffic speeds might slow down a little bit to like your acceptable level. And similarly, if the city is too congested, uh, the, city, the city itself could just buy up uh, the lower valued uh, vehicle licenses and then traffic uh, speeds would go up and you'd get to sort of your acceptable level of congestion. Um, so this is, uh, and in the paper, we go into a bit more detail on comparing this to the other um, currently existing methods of managing congestion and pricing congestion and we, um, kind of describe uh, in more depth why we think this is uh, actually the optimal way to go rather than the more typical uh, congestion pricing um, schemes that are that are in use around the world. 
So that's that's the second one. Um, I don't know, Matt, Matt, do you have anything to say before we move on next to, to quadratic finance? Um, no, not, not unless you have questions, Curtis. Nope. Jump in at any time. So quadratic finance, um, as we mentioned at the outset, is a new method for public good provision, which solves the, the classic uh, free rider and under provision of public goods problems, as well as um, information uh, problem faced by the government, which is um, you know, the government may or may not know how much of a certain public good to produce and private individuals um, may know how much they would like but have incentives to free ride and under contribute if left to a decentralized private provision of, of public goods. So um, current approaches uh, that try to try to address these problems um, involving matching funds uh, are, are good insofar as they can augment private contributions and bring provision of a public good up closer to its optimal, le optimal level. Um, but as we, we have a few pictures from uh, uh, screenshots here from uh, uh, public election, uh, public campaign matching funds. So on the left, the New York City uh, matching fund that is, in, is, is currently in use, you can see that they have an eight to one match. And on the right, this is um, Senator Elizabeth Warren's um, proposed uh, Campaign matching fund from her presidential campaign with a six to one match, and so these are these are good insofar as they're matching funds. But uh, we think quadratic finance is is superior because it proposes um, like an optimal mechanism for for arriving at that match rather than just a sort of uh, fixed uh, number that's been chosen. So that's that's sort of the rationale of like the types of situations you'd want to apply. Um, QF2, public goods problems. Um, and now a little bit about how it works. So this, so yeah, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of symbols here. It looks, looks kind of complicated, but we'll walk through a couple examples and, and hopefully folks will see that it's actually not. So in QF, you first figure out the total funding for a proposal based on the individual voluntary contributions that have been made. Then you subtract the individual contributions from the total funding to get the match needed. So there'll be a public matching fund that supplies a match um, to fill that gap basically between individual contributions and total funding. So the top expression here, this is how you figure out the total funding. You sum up the individual contributions. So CI um, is individual contribution and, and P here is just referring to project P. So you sum up the square roots of the individual contributions. Um, you got that sum, then you square it and that gets the total funding. And then you simply subtract the, the sum of the private contributions um, that have been made to get the match. I think an easier way to see this is with an example, of course. So this is a really, a really pared down community of three citizens, ABC, with three potential projects in their city they could uh, contribute to. And if you just look at the left column on the fixed streets project, so citizen A has contributed $9, B has contributed one, and C has contributed four. And so if you, going back, going back to the formula I just described, so first we take the square roots of the private contributions, we sum them, and then we square that. So this is, this is what's going on here. So the 36 is the total funding amount because the square root of uh, citizen A's contribution is three, plus one is four, plus two, which is a square root of citizen C's, that gets us up to six. So we square six to get the total funding. And then we just subtract uh, the total pledged, which is 14, which is simply the sum of what's actually been contributed. Uh, so that gets us to the match required. So that's just sort of the couple step process. And you know, the same thing, the, the same thing is happening here on Build play, play, Playground, we have one, plus four, that gets us five. You square that to get the 25 total. Um, and the, and sort of like the, the, the way that QF solves the, the free rider and incentive problem is because it rewards the most widely shared, widely beneficial public goods. So you can see, uh, you can see here, the largest match is going to fix streets because that's a, a really widely shared preference. So the so you know the the other ones were less widely shared preferences, um, and we sort of show this a bit more graphically with an, another simple example here of twenty five citizens who are contributing to three projects. That in each case, in each of these three columns, the total amount of money pledged is two hundred dollars, but by far the largest match is going to project A because that two hundred dollars was pledged by twenty citizens, um, and so they get a huge match versus 
just say, you know, two wealthy citizens uh, who happen to like Project C contribute over here and they get um, a relatively small match. So this is, uh, this is sort of the democratic, uh, sort of like pro-democratic influence of quadratic financing to reveal um, the projects that are going to be most widely beneficial and um, incentivize people to, to privately contribute to them. Um, so that, that's on the mechanism. And then we have two, two use cases that we go through in the paper for QF in, uh, in charter cities. So uh, investments in infrastructure is, is a sort of classic area that uh, local governments around the world struggle with is appropriately allocating funds to um, especially repair and maintain, but also knowing, um, knowing when and where to, to build new infrastructure projects. And so we think the sort of decentralized private knowledge and preferences could be, uh, could be really useful here. So uh, step one, there'd be a project proposal phase. So the contributors, the uh, you know, citizens in the charter city would submit project proposals and could, uh, could somehow vote on those proposals. Uh, you know, we're gonna talk about quadratic voting in a few minutes, of course, uh, in an online system. And one, uh, one mechanism that's already in use here that sort of resembles this is Taiwan's uh, presidential hackathon. Um, and, and then planners in the city could sort of uh, curate that list to make sure that the projects are complementary and not you know, directly undercutting each other. And then contributors would have that menu of options to uh, use, use QF on and make their contributions um, and be, be properly incentivized to do so with the mechanism. And then the final step, the city would, uh, before undertaking these new projects, would allocate funding to repair or maintain its infrastructure uh, assets to, to reach some sort of acceptable level of, uh, of long-term maintenance, and then release uh, the rest of the funds as a matching fund for quadratic, uh, for quadratic finance. So that's, uh, that's on infrastructure. The other one on, on, on campaign finance, talked a bit a few slides ago about the, the suboptimal matching, matching mechanisms that we've seen in the real world. Um, and so we think that QF would be, would be really great here. We have a simple three-step process. So the first step, candidates, you know, as in normal elections, could get some threshold level of signatures to get on the ballot. Then there would be repeated time windows for matching. So say uh, each quarter, there's a certain amount of public matching funds that would be allocated via QF based on the contributions made in that quarter. Um, and we think this would be a little bit better than doing just one really giant QF because that could create sort of a, a, a discontinuity where one candidate who gets a lot of momentum early on would get you know a huge match and then drown out the uh, advertisements and information of other candidates. So instead, we want to reward candidates that get repeated widespread support through QF um, over time periods. Um, you know, and then you and then you move on to step three, having your having your elections hopefully with um, uh, a better uh, better information and um, a healthier uh, campaign process. So that's that's QF for campaign finance. Um, Matt, any any thoughts or anything you want to say before we move on? Um, no, I just think you know there's there's another there are several other kinds of interesting examples where you can think about uh, QF uh, working that might help kind of illustrate what it is and how, how it works. So I think another interesting example is not so much on charter cities, but just just kind of illustrative is in uh, homeowners associations like HOAs. So HOAs are 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 um, a great way to think about where this where this could could be beneficially used because everyone's you know the the homeowner association represents uh, is responsible for basically providing public goods like underfunded public goods to to its constituents. Uh, you know there's a there's a free rider problem with respect to all of the things that, that HOAs provide like you know um, like beautifying the common area and this, that, the other thing. Um, and uh, it's really easy to imagine quadratic funding improving the effectiveness. Oh, and it looks like we're about to get um, booted from Zoom here. So should I? Okay, sorry about that. A bit of technical difficulties. Everyone right now is dealing with some Zoom issues. Um, so I'll, I'll put it back to Paul here to start back off where he abruptly left off. Paul? Okay, thanks, Curtis. So I'm uh, I'm sharing my screen now. Going to go into presentation mode. 
momentarily. Okay, so we had just uh, we had, had, had had just wrapped up our discussion on quadratic finance. So we'll now move on to our final mechanism, quadratic voting, and then a bit of a Q and A and discussion. So uh, quadratic voting is uh, is a bit simpler than than uh, salsa and QF. So this should be should be a little bit quicker. Um, so QV is uh, an innovative voting mechanism. Uh, it can be used in uh, really a, a lot of different settings. Basically, any setting where um, decision making or prioritization is happening, and the intensity of, of preferences um, matters for for the outcome. Um, and so, the QV improves upon um, typical voting, which we refer to as one person one vote. Um, basically, typical voting procedures, um, you know, like in elections, where you just you vote for the candidate you want to win, and the person with the most votes um, wins. Um, that that type of voting procedure doesn't allow individuals to express the intensity of you know how much more they prefer one candidate or one option to the others, um, and that leads to a couple problems. Um, most famously, um, in sort of political theory, uh, the tyranny of the majority is a problem where an option or a candidate it will win when it's preferred by only a little bit um, by a majority, and that can drown out a small minority that intensely prefers another candidate to win. Um, and that sort of like doesn't maximize social welfare and is a, is a deep problem with um, typical voting um, and also polarization. Um, that polarization can be incentivized, uh, you created for, for many reasons, but um, sort of one person, one vote first past the post um, elections ha have been, you know, have been shown to, to create that as well. So how does it work? Uh, this, this chart here shows very simply how quadratic voting works. So voters get a certain number of vote credits that they can allocate to uh, the different options on the menu. And the number of, uh, the number of votes that you cast, it has a cost that is quadratic. So if you wanna cast two votes for an option, that will cost you four credits. Two, you know, two squared is four. If you wanna increase that to three votes, Increasing it by just one vote is going to cost you five more credits to get to a total of nine. So you just you just take the number of votes you want to cast and square it, and that's the cost in credits. And so um, voters will be given like a budget. So um, you know everybody gets a hundred credits, and they can allocate them across the options. And so you can see pretty quickly um, you would you would exhaust your credits by uh, you know you, you could express a loud voice on one candidate and, and put put them all there, but that's going to be really costly. Um, and so quadratic voting incentivizes candidates to appeal to a wide range of preferences. Um, these are sort of arith brief um, arithmetic level examples of uh, how QV avoids the problems uh, that, that I discussed. So on tyranny of the majority here, so we have a set of voters, so just three, three voters, person one, two, and three, and we show what would happen under QV and what would happen under one person, one vote. So on the tyranny of the majority, persons two and three, um, their preferences are reflected in um, how they allocate their credits. And so you can see they, they prefer the far right, you know, this is just a hypothetical example, they slightly prefer the far right candidate. Um, and so if they could only cast one vote, uh, that, is the, that is the candidate they most prefer, even if only by a little bit, so they would vote for that candidate. And under one person, one vote, that candidate would get two votes to, to one of the far left candidate and that candidate would win. Meanwhile, the first person who prefers the far left candidate really intensely prefers that candidate. And so um, under quadratic voting, they could express that preference, that intensity, and that would be added to the votes of the, the other two people who still have a little bit of preference for that candidate. Um, and so that would, uh, that would sum up to uh, basically the uh, more total votes here for the far left candidate, and that would sort of allow that um, intensity to, to be shown. Um, and then on, on decreasing polarization, another, just another quick setup here. So we have, uh, again, three people, same, same kind of hypothetical scenario. So in, in one person, one vote, the far left candidate, uh, the far left candidate wins because, uh, because of the way, basically the voters preferences are arranged such that everyone, ha everyone has a center candidate as their like second and third choice. And so that, that total amount of preference of credits under QV adds up to more, under QV it adds up to more total votes, um, even, if, uh, even if under one person, one vote. 
a far right, uh, a far right or a far left candidate would have won. So these are just simple um, arithmetic examples, but this is basically the, the deep insight of quadratic voting is you can express the, your intensity of preference um, and arrive at a more socially optimal um, uh, voting outcome. So in charter cities, um, there are two, two simple settings that we think QP would be great for. So first, just city, citywide elections, um, particularly high turnout, high salience elections where you have multiple candidates. So, you know, a, a mayoral election or other similar offices for uh, governing, you know, governing councils. Um, you know, you'd have a simple ballot that sort of looks something like this. Um, one under one person, one vote. We're all, we're all, um, you know, somewhat used to you, you know, go to the ballot box and you just check off the one candidate that you prefer. But under QV, uh, you could it could be done digitally. It could be done just in writing, um, writing the number of credits you want to allocate to each candidate, um, like so. Um, and if uh, and you know, for for ease of use, of course, um, every individual citizen may not perfectly sum up their credits to like 100 or whatever the number is. And so if, if someone's credits add up to more than 100 or less than 100, you could simply proportionally scale their votes so that you're not uh, penalizing people or not counting their votes, um, uh, you know, which, which would be uh, pretty bad. So th this, would, this would be, uh, I think, fairly, you know, we think fairly simple to, to implement in citywide multi-candidate elections. Um, and then on the, in terms of the, the internal um, decision-making aspects of government, uh, we, we also think QB could be really useful, and this is best illustrated by way of an example. So um, this is in uh, 2018 in the U.S. state of Colorado. The Democratic Caucus and their House of Representatives actually piloted QB to prioritize among different spending bills that that caucus wanted to um, you know, spend their time and resources on advocating for. So this is, uh, this is a, a graph showing what happened was uh, they, they have all these, uh, you know, all these potential bills, and this is the number of uh, number of votes that each bill got. And so this is this gave them a really precise um, sort of disciplined view on where to allocate their their resources. And and so you know the Equal Pay for Equal Work Act, um, you know, came out came out to the top, and that may or may not have happened um, under just a simple simple voting or sort of committee conversations where it's it's harder to see. What, how intense people's preferences are and what they might trade off against what. Um, so this was a, a pretty successful example of an internal governance decision-making process that we think that, um, you know, high-level governing committees in charter cities could uh, could also use pretty well. Um, so that's, that, that's the, those are the use cases on quadratic voting. And then just a final word on um, implementation. So uh, you know, if, if charter cities are going to think about actually doing this, um, we have a few tech partnerships. Uh, right, our Radical Exchange has a few tech partnerships with uh, on QV in particular with um, Democracy Earth, Polco, and Deora. Um, those are those are you know tech companies that are actually producing the pro products where you can use a QV interface. Um, the others are a bit less advanced at the moment. Um, Salsa, there are some open source uh, GitHub packages that are uh, workable. Um, and same for QF. Uh, I don't know if Matt, you want to jump in and, and say anything else on the implementation side. QF should also uh, have uh, should highlight uh, Gitcoin's um, uh, a project it's called Gitcoin Grants, uh, which is basically a um, a project that enables um, enables people to fund uh, open source projects in the in the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, and gives gives their fund gives their contributions matches from a from a quadratic fund, uh, you know, from a quadratic finance structured matching fund. Um, and um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's several other other things that are kind of on the on the horizon. There, I mean, there are a few non-public projects that we're working with. We're working with government um, entities at the moment that I can't talk about that much, and. Um, uh, Polco is also building a quadratic funding um, uh, tool uh, that uh, that aimed at use by uh, municipal authorities uh, in, in like focus on the United States, um, and that um, that should be available later this year. Um, and, and there are other examples of of um, uh, uh, Smaller scale projects that have successfully used salsa, um, including like um, uh, the, there was a, a a demonstration called an artwork, which is always on sale, put together by the artist and programmer, 
uh, Simon de la Rouvier, um, which is uh, which allows people to sort of uh, uh, buy uh, control over a piece of art through a continuous auction. And people have also built demonstrations of using salsa for control over over uh, like advertisement space, um, and uh, and like you know uh, pixel maps and and those kinds of things. And so there there's actually there's a lot of uh, of open source um, packages uh, that uh, that can be readily kind of picked up and and used to uh, to implement uh, implement salsa if you if you've got the you know the 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 ability to uh, you know work work with something that you find on GitHub. Great. And I, I did want to add one uh, one more little piece of color commentary on QV if it's not. If it's all right, go for it. So the one um, one important way, uh, important kind of angle on this is that so actually on this slide you can see uh, Representative Hansen um, talks about how the year. So we actually did uh, uh, quadratic voting uh, with the with. Uh, the, the House Representatives in uh, 2019 and 2018, they used a different system where they they allowed people to they gave basically they gave you the voting credits and allowed them to allocate the voting credits to the things that they liked the best so that they could concentrate their voting credits, but without the quadratic pricing feature. So you could just sort of linearly take you take all of your votes and put them on the one bill that you liked the best if that if if that was what you liked the best. And uh, what Representative Hansen is saying there is that the problem with, you know, the, the quadratic voting worked better than that because it yielded this kind of smooth curve showing like, the, like, uh, like a, a detailed distribution of precisely how much support each, uh, each bill got. Whereas, you know, using, using a linear system, you basically just end up with a, with a, a, a undifferentiated clump of bills that get a lot of support, and then another undifferentiated long tail of bills that got little support with no, with you know, no uh, like statistically meaningful difference between those low levels of support that they got. Um, and the reason that 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 happens is that if you don't if you don't price vote uh, concentration quadratically, then the the correct strategy basically. Is to is to concentrate your votes as much as you can possibly stand to, um, and and in that kind of system, the um, uh, you know the, the consequence is that basically the loudest voices carry the day. Mm -hmm. So the the quadratic pricing of uh, on vote concentration is like a, it's it's a way of pricing of putting a price on zealotry. So that you are, uh, so the voters are incentivized to basically speak with a softer voice, uh, where they, where they don't really, really feel the need to speak with a loud voice, mm. and um, so it helps. It, it, it's 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 creating a really subtle balance between you know these different failure modes in in um, in, in different voting systems. Great. Yeah, so with that, um, we, we can move into the, the you know, question and answer if you have uh, any questions you want to ask us, Curtis. Great, yeah. Um, so first of all, thanks again, guys, so much. And uh, apologies again for the technical difficulties. Uh, bear with us. Um, so uh, for the Q&A, so first and foremost, um, a common, I guess, critique that I foresee when it comes to <clears throat> to baking these new radical exchange ideas into charter cities is that the idea of charter cities in and of itself is already a pretty radical idea for host country governments to to agree to right um and then on top of this we're asking these these host country governments to also experiment with these relatively you know untested um novel pretty different mechanisms with salsa quadratic finance uh, quadratic voting um, and then including these mechanisms within already pretty radical charter city reforms. I could see that um, that's a lot to swallow politically for these host country governments who, uh, you know, because a lot of their citizens are already close to the subsistence constraint, can't afford for these experiments to, to fail. 
uh, at least as much as uh, high income countries can afford to experiment. So I guess I'll just put it to you. How would you guys respond to this potential critique? Um, well, I, I think that, you know, one, um, the, the most important part of the answer is to just to see, to see everything with a spirit of experimentation. So, I mean, I think that one of the best features of charter cities is that they allow, uh, allow governments to, to try things, you know, and you, there's no, there's no need necessarily, um, to, to take these ideas and apply them uh, in like a blanket style to the entirety of a charter city. So for example, you could, you could certainly take, um, you know, if, if you had a, a whole charter city or a special economic zone, you could set aside part of it. And, you know, let's, let's say like, you know, uh, like one part of the uh, commercial real estate uh, oriented district of the, um, of the land, say, and manage that part using um using salsa licenses right or you or you could take you could set aside a certain portion of the of the uh uh common uh of the of the funding for common goods and um and, and just use uh use just this portion that you can afford to experiment with for as a matching fund for for quadratic funding hmm. so in other words um there you know there's no uh there's no need to um uh boil the ocean right away but but charter cities are in a perfect opportunity to like see whether these things uh you know when when really put out there in the wild in like a real economic situation mm -hmm. um indeed uh um in, in, indeed pay off um, you know, the, and the other thing is that, you know, pe pe in, in, in these kinds of, of special, um, you know, in charter cities and special economic zones, there's an expectation that the rules are going to be different, right? So the kind of the cultural baggage that people bring in where they expect that I expect this is how voting works. I expect this is how property rights work, right? There's already uh, a difference between how it works in, in the special zone and in the and in a broader society. So you have the opportunity to be like unburdened by, by, by history and expectation and, and to try new things. Yeah, and I guess it just like what you said kind of spurred the Thibaultian kind of voting with your feet thing. If they're already choosing uh, to move to the charter city in the first place, knowing these rules will be in place, then it's a, it's a, it's a choice made from freedom anyways, so yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah, exactly. and then just like just one minor uh, addendum to that is another um, another sort of like democratically enforcing mechanism you can use is uh, I like their great example of uh, Stockholm's congestion pricing scheme. They announced it for this reason because people are nervous frequently about these kinds of new weird policies. They announced in advance we're going to try out congestion pricing, and then a year later we're going to have a referendum. Uh, about whether to keep it and people liked it so much because it's an effective way to manage traffic that uh, majority voted to keep it and so i could imagine you know a similar thing happening in charter cities um insofar as insofar as um you know given everything that said there's still a little bit of skittishness you could say hey we think these are gonna improve on the clear market failures in in other contexts and so we can kind of vote on these um, after okay well one other one thing that i would add is that is that these all of these institutions that we're describing here are institutions that allow less powerful parties to have more of a say than they do in legacy institutions. So, I mean, I, th I think one, uh, one critique of, of charter cities that is occasionally uh, reasonable is that they, um, you, you know, they'll basically they'll end up being centers of power for um, you know, for wealthy people or businesses who, who are, are able to, um, able to play in that sandbox, right? Mm -hmm. Something like salsa, uh, keeps the asset prices lower, right? It keeps the pri the price of admission lower. So it enables a larger set of people to, um, to participate in the economy of the, of the special zone. Um, and, and then precisely the same thing is true for quadratic funding and quadratic finance and quadratic voting that, you know, um, uh, um, 
it's 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 drawing more people in it's allowing more uh you know small traditionally marginalized voices to um uh to to participate in the decision making mm -hmm. okay great um so as i you know sort of alluded to at the beginning um when i did that brief intro so the, the charter cities institute we, right we have the mission of lifting tens of millions of people out of poverty so naturally we're, we're focused a lot on improving governance in, in low-income countries so uh, what would you guys say the main differences would be between implementing these new policy mechanisms in, in a high-income context versus versus a more low-income country so i think several of the concerns that you might otherwise have about implementing these policies in a lower income region will, will to some degree be mitigated uh, insofar as they're tried out in a charter city, which sort of like by design has more, you know, more reliable um, contract enforcement and lower corruption and things like that. Because like, you know, trying out a new voting system in a corrupt region uh, you know, wouldn't really be great no matter how good the voting mechanism is. And so, so, so at, at the outset, I would say I'm less concerned with, with, with this because we're talking about experiment with them in charter cities specifically rather than across a whole country that might otherwise have these governance challenges. Um, having said that, there may still be issues like um, sort of technology, you know, the prevalence of, of technology or familiarity. Um, but, but honestly, I also see kind of upside because people may be less, uh, may have a less, less of a status quo bias with certain voting systems or certain um, allocations of property rights. Um, so that, that's, that's kind of, I guess that, that's my view on it is that you might want to make at the margin, some adjustments, like making sure that there's ways to use a salsa exchange, um, digitally, like, and in person at, um, whether it's at a city hall type of building or other, uh, civic centers across the city, like that they're adequately geographically dispersed so that people could somehow, uh, physically like look through the assets that are available on a public computer interface or something like that. Um, um, you know, Matt, Matt, do you have anything else to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, I, in a way, um, these kinds of institutions, which are designed to, uh, like, both facilitate economic growth and avoid creating wealth and power concentrations, are like exactly the kinds of things that, uh, that you would want to, um, uh, to, um, use in 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 countries where there are uh, disparities of wealth and power that you're trying to address, right? Like, so I mean, I think basically, I, I think that these kinds of institutions are, uh, you know, can and should improve the functioning of like Western democratic uh, um, developed world institutions. Uh, first of all. Um, but there's no, you know, I, there's not a huge difference in my mind about how, you know, their applicability to the developed world and the developing world. Um, and, and I think that like, you know, if you think about it from the other perspective, it's like, you know, in the developed world, we've got terrible, uh, concentrations of wealth and power, right? So we probably shouldn't just take the like default playbook from, from uh, developed countries and, and think that that's gonna, you know, result in something different in, mm -hmm. in the developing world. Um, I mean, so I think that, you know, there's, uh, uh, you know, an, an imperative to, to, to try this stuff, you know, it, yeah. everywhere. Yeah, the very fact of where we're at now in these, in these currently developed countries is the motivation behind trying new stuff in, in other areas. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, great. So, so in the in the paper, you guys discuss how um, salsa solves several problems around land use, uh, including the issue that private ownership of land it, it inhibits, as you say, allocative efficiency because of this problem you described as the holdout problem, right? This granny from up uh, refusing to sell her property when the when the corporate guys are trying to do a development. Um, so. So first, maybe just re-explain that the holdout problem and, and what that is for everyone. And then second, is the holdout problem, is that similar or the same as, as NIMBYism? Um, and, and does Salsa then also solve the, the problem of NIMBYism that many cities 
uh, face today? Um, yeah, so I'll I'll take a stab at this, and then Matt can Matt can uh, add on. So so the short answer is they are they are two distinct types of problems. Salsa may help with both, but it it certainly helps with the holdout problem. So uh, the holdout problem again is when you have uh, multiple parcels of land that need to be assembled for one larger project, um, which will have uh, you know which will create some some new more productive uh, use of that land. And as the individual landowners become aware that each single parcel is essential to that project um, that needs to assemble all of them, they each have an incentive to overvalue, overprice their land, and hold out for um, a much larger share um, uh, of payment. And, and so, you know, as as this happens, they behave like little monopolists, and then fewer overall projects will will happen uh, across the world. And you know, in the world of um, urban economics, some suggestive evidence that this is a serious problem is that um, is, is in urban sprawl. So like big projects that need to assemble lots of uh, land typically can't, uh, typically happen less in places where there's already, there's already activity because people are unwilling to, uh, people will, will, will raise their prices basically. Um, and so that, that may create cities that are more sprawled out than optimal. Um, now the problem of NIMBYism is slow different because nimbyism is a little bit more of a is, is a little bit more of a problem of externalities and the scope of political voice and decision making so like just at a very basic level uh, you know one one finding that that illustrates that nimbyism is, is a problem is um, research shows that if you ask people in a city um, do you think that your city should have more housing opportunities in it you know should there be more housing bills they'll say yes but then if you ask them do you think that there should be more housing in your neighborhood in the city, they'll say no. And so obviously it can't be true. You know, everyone can't, we can't achieve the overall goal if we satisfy everyone's local preferences. And um, even if you, and so, so, so how this manifests itself is like zoning and land use decisions frequently um, incorporate uh, the, the influence and the voices of neighbors who will have to approve of some project or who, or who can, and or who can exercise outsized influence at, um, you know, zoning hearing meetings and say how much they don't want a certain project to be built because it'll increase the traffic on their block. And then their you know, local city councilor who wants to get reelected will uh, have to sort of listen to that and also not support the project. And then we don't have housing that gets built. Um, and so that's, that's kind of fundamentally a problem of the way that zoning land use and political power works. So like if, if uh, you know, if housing decisions could get made at the, the, the city level or even the state level rather than the local level, this this uh, this problem of neighbors being able to act on a negative externality that they don't want um, would be less of a problem. So it's uh, I view it a little bit more as a scope of decision making, whereas the holdout problem that also solves um, is more on individual incentives in the case of a land assembly. Um, and so salsa, so so salsa would not. So salsa obviously helps with the holdout problem. It would it, less so on the NIMBY problem without some other change. Uh, in the political process with the level of decision making um, of how something works. So, uh, Matt, anything you'd add to that? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think one way of understanding it, the NIMBY problem takes a slightly different shape in, in different jurisdictions, but um, in many cases, it, it really has to do with zoning. And, um, uh, you know, if you, if you simply kept the zoning restrictions in place uh, and, you know, uh, w when when you uh, you know shifted to a salsa license version of land tenure, then those zoning restrictions would like still be a problem, you know. Um, but I think that I, I my uh, my position on this is that we can and should um, roll back a lot of zoning restrictions and open up a lot of that stuff um, while uh, you know while also um, shifting to, to, to this system. So like they're, they're like partly orthogonal, mm -hmm. um, but they are, they're also related in a way because salsa would allow, um, the sort of collective intelligence of the, of the community and of the market to decide what the best use of any particular land is. And, and the, the community and the market would do a better job at that than zoning. So in other words, it, it would partly replace the you know the uh, clumsy centralized decision making that city zoning uh, boards are, are are trying to do, um, 
but uh, but then if you still had the zoning restrictions in place with with salsa, then they would still be a problem, right? So they, they interact in a complex way, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. Well, that is all the questions that I had, and and we're kind of at time anyway. So um, once again, guys, thanks so much. And I, I see you have um, some options uh, to get in contact for folks who watch this and want to learn more or want to get involved. So I'll let one of you, maybe maybe Matt, you can go through these contact options. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, you, you can um, you know f follow us on Twitter and check out radicalexchange.org to see what we're doing. Um, sign up for our mailing list. Uh, we're, we're putting together a, a virtual uh, conference in, in, in June, which is gonna be fantastic. It's gonna have amazing, 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 brilliant, high level uh, speakers and conversations from people all over the world. Um, and, uh, um, Make you know, sure to so upgrade to Zoom Pro, right? So you get it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, you know, uh, feel feel free to reach out. Um, we're you know we're very accessible and 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 always happy to to talk to people and and find new things to work on. Awesome. Uh, and as I said at the beginning, I'm Curtis Lockhart. I'm a researcher at the Charter Cities Institute. Um, you can learn more about CCI's work at chartercitiesinstitute.org or subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is where this will go. Uh, or follow us on Twitter at cci.dot um, city c i t y. Um, so with that, thanks so much again, Matt and Paul. You guys have a great weekend and and stay safe. You too. Thanks. thanks. Yeah.